Good morning, everybody. If you're not familiar with me, my name is Ryan. I am uh, one of the builders here at Performa Built. I do a lot of the uh, YouTube videos, behind the scenes stuff, a lot of technical things here. And uh, if you've never seen our YouTube before, and what I'm doing today is a, is a pretty broad uh, introduction to what I'm gonna be doing this year. If you've never seen us before, you know, or actually you wouldn't know, that we have many videos on YouTube of building the four speed overdrives, 4060, 4080, 200, 4R, Fords, you name it. Uh, those are great videos for you to watch. Uh, they're really instructional. I think I do a pretty decent job. Um, they're a good amount of time, about two hours long on average. Uh, so crack a beer or whatever your pension is and enjoy those. Today and this year, something I, I wanted to get at because overall we, we've grown so much. We have a whole new building, new facility, and uh, our reputation is just tremendously awesome. And I can't thank you guys enough for spreading the word, sharing your support. I mean, you, you guys are out there bragging about us and I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate it. It makes me feel good because um, I put a lot of work into this. Uh, that being said, the world knows that we can build transmissions. There's videos on that. We aren't going to be doing hardly any of that this year. I might do a couple. Um, what I want to do this year is a real big ass overview on a lot of the smaller things that are actually pretty major. Um, things that are a lot out of my hands and that are in your hands. Uh, there's a lot of common knowledge that kind of got tossed to the wayside in the history of transmissions that's really entirely up to the customer or the installer, you know, whoever's doing it. The video today is gonna be, a, the basis is gonna be about our instruction sheet that I know everybody throws away. Um, in that instruction sheet is all the common knowledge you will ever need. And today I have a lot of examples to go along with that. So this would be a good video for you to watch whether you're a complete rookie or a veteran or a GM master tech, it really doesn't matter. Um, I still encourage you to read a specific manufacturer instruction. Uh, for those guys that think they know it all, I'm not gonna be able to help you and you're never gonna go much farther uh, in your automotive career if you have that attitude. Uh, and, and just saying that, just to give you a background so I don't sound so full of it, is I've been doing this since 14 years old. I am now almost 31 this year. It's a good 16 years. Um, I am 100% self-taught. We didn't have YouTube uh, when I was 14 or 16. It wasn't very good uh, back then, not like it is now. That being said, I have customers that come in here constantly. I'm constantly talking to people on the phone and I learn things here every day. Um, I know a lot of stuff, but there's things that get thrown out in a conversation where I'm like, oh shit, I didn't know that. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm stressing, no matter how good you are or how good you think you are. If you're ASE, GM, Master Tech, uh, have been doing this longer than I've been alive, complete newbie, I'm only here to help you today. And you should just give it a chance. Uh, the biggest thing is, why I'm going over this is GM has their own specifications to the 4L60 and whatnot, and we know that GM couldn't make them hold any power worth a damn. It, it just is. Um, you know, it being cost effective, it's GM. We are a specific manufacturer along with many others, and throughout the years of doing these over and over and over and over again, we've seen all the problems it has, we've seen everything that we can do to it, and we've compiled a lot of that general knowledge into this packet. Where this packet comes into play, if you've never been or had a performer built unit before or are not familiar with us and are thinking about it, this packet comes in a little care package with your transmission. Now, the reason I say I know it gets tossed to the wayside is because I get every question in the book on the phone that comes from this every day. Um, and it's, it's, I don't even mind answering it, but it would save you a lot of aggravation 
and everything. If you just looked it up, you would learn something. Where this comes from is, if you've dealt with us before, if you have a unit of ours, you kind of know what we, we expect. Uh, we, we, me and Alan and Frank, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to people, educating them, and telling them everything we could possibly could that's in this packet prior to even taking this thing home. Um, I think that's why we have a good reputation, better than, well, better than everybody's. I think we have the best one. Um, we talk everybody through everything, every unit, I, I swear we do. And it, it's pretty demanding considering the amount of customers we have, but it's really worth it because it saves a lot of future headaches and we just don't have issues like other companies do. Um, you buy another company's, you bought it, they got your money and they don't really want to hear from me again. We want to see time slips. We want to see your car. We want to see everybody happy. It makes us sleep well at night. And it's a lot of fun because we're out here doing the same thing. I have several cars. Some are broke on jack stands. Others are ripping the streets up. Uh, I've failed. I've succeeded. I've done budget builds to expensive ones. It's, you know, when you actually have people that, that are into that too, we can go do great things. If you've never talked with me, Alan or Frank, like I said, we spend a lot of time with people and we are available. Um, 365 days a week, or sorry, 365 days a year. And we answer the phone till about nine to 10 PM Eastern time, roughly, um, every night. And, and we enjoy talking to everybody. We want everybody to have a good experience. And, and that's why we do this. That's why we work all the time. Um, that being said, we all do this too. So honestly, it doesn't really work. It's really nice. The biggest thing I'm going to go over, like I said, is our instructions and several examples. So kind of jumping in here and we have a new setup and everything, which is super sweet. So this is what you'll see when you, when you get the transmission. So for starters, you're going to call or go right online and you will have placed the order. We need a couple weeks to build it. We're very busy and we have been a small shop up until recently. That being said, you finally get this thing. UPS shows up. It's a big ass box and you tear it open. You shred it like a kid at Christmas. And there's your transmission that you've been anticipating. You've read a lot of good things about us. Your hopes are high and we aren't going to let you down. The one thing that bothers me is this gets thrown by the wayside and I get it. I get it. You know, you've been waiting on this thing. You're excited. You want to put it in you want to go fast, pump the brakes boss. Um, we, some, one thing I know about people in general is and, and myself included, we don't typically look at the instructions till we've screwed up. Um, and then we might pull it out of the garbage and be like, oh yeah, forgot to put that screw there. This is something to where transmissions are a little bit more technical than how to operate your kitchen blender or assembling that cheap grill from Walmart um, or making pancakes from the Bisquick box. It's a little bit more complicated. And that's why I encourage people to read it. Not only is it complicated, um, it really does anything. Uh, so that's why I'm here today. That's what we're going to go over. Hopefully I can teach you guys something. And if you ever do get one of our units, please just sit down, have a drink, read the instructions, whatever you got to do. Just give it a glance. That's all we're asking. Going back to the instructions here, this is the first page. Congratulations. Welcome to perform a bill. And, and we do, we're all, we, me, Alan and Frank, we have lots of customers, lots. And I don't know how we do it, but we typically remember most of you and what cars you drive. Uh, the human mind is amazing. So like this says, and then it kind of goes into you know, some of the most important things like bypassing a radiator, which we're going to get into in a second. And then at the bottom, if you have any, any, any questions, and like I said, we don't give a damn about what time it is. 
All we want to do is help you and give you a good experience. So please call us here, 570-578-5686 or the toll free number at 1-888-744-6542. And you will usually get Alan. He's a great man, a very friendly man. And he, if he can't answer it, he will forward that call to either myself or Frank. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been doing this a while. I'm very good at it. Frank is actually my mentor. As I said, I was mostly self-taught. Frank's the guy who picked up that rest of the slack and taught me a lot more about these than I ever knew. Uh, he's come up with our designs overall. Me and Frank have worked together. Uh, he's probably done 99% of it. I've attributed about 1%. Uh, but we make a very good team. Um, in that aspect we're always finding new modifications to do hydraulically so we want to help you me and frank will usually be the guys you talk to uh, for tech support and if you don't have a sales question please don't call the 888 number we have a tech line right on the website our website is www.performabilt.com i thought it was on the sign but i guess it isn't um you can find if you lose this warranty packet and you want to give it a glance, you can find that right on the website. It's there in black and white. All of our specs, all of our pricing, all of our phone numbers, anything you need is right there at www.performerbuilt.com. Um, going back into this, we're going to start off with the uh, bypassing the radiator. Step one, one of the most important things. So if you have a 225,000 mile radiator that's plastic from GM, I got news for you. It is not smart. Get rid of that thing. Uh, and if you can't get rid of it, just plug the plastic part where the tranny cooler tube is and bypass it with a standalone cooler. We provide you with a free cooler with every transmission. It's uh, it's pretty good for most street applications. Um, if you're a track guy, I expect you to have a better cooler, but if you're just riding around on the street or cruising, and even if you're getting a little hot, putting a fan on this usually does the job. I actually do run two of the, this cooler right here in two of my vehicles myself. Uh, they're a little bit low powered, but it works well. And it's really easy to hook up. It's got all the hoses, um, fittings, etc., in that packet. That being said, and, and it's been skewed a little bit, a lot of people think you must use this cooler or your warranty is void. That is wrong. Um, it's kind of a play on words there. We just require you to use a standalone cooler. And I highly encourage you, if you have a better one than that, please use it. Uh, the true cool 40 K is personally my choice in performance. I think it's the end all be all. I don't really like some of the others like derail. Um, they have a really good name. I just think they're a little bit more expensive for what they do. And, and the true cool is kind of where it's at in my book. And that's, we're talking pretty moderately powered application, something under 500 horse and just driving. This will be fine for you. Excuse me. Um, so if you have a better cooler, it is extremely windy outside. If you have a better cooler, um, please <coughs> use it. Going up to temps, um, if the danger zone for a transmission is about 230 degrees, um, 220, believe it or not, is pretty factory. Um, that's safe, believe it or not. I don't like to get up there, but if you're running 220, like let's say you live in Arizona, it's a summer day, it's normal. Most of our customers run anywhere from 160 to 180, or to 180 degrees, 160 to 180. Um, that's usually what you'll get for a little bit better cooler. Than there is no such thing as too cool though. If you get this thing down to 100 or 80 or little bit different than a motor. Um, temps aren't really that crucial cold as they are hot. Uh, it's really a whole different scenario. So, 
page one there. Slide this over here. Next page here, and, and I don't know if my screen's cloudy or if my camera's blurry. I'm not sure. But again, I will post pictures, uh, pictures of this packet onto Facebook if you'd like to check it out. It's just performable transmissions. And again, it's on the website if this is a little bit hard. At least you know where to look. Um, this page and the next one are probably the most important pages in the whole packet. Um, this is where a lot of the technical advice is, especially on the torque converter. And the torque converter is one of those things where there's an air of mystery around it, kind of, I think, more so than a transmission. Nobody knows how these things really work. Um, and I will be doing a video on that. I have a real kind of a, a shitty cutaway here. I did with an angle grinder. I'm going to clean it up. This is just for appearances today. But, um... It's basically your fluid coupling, and it operates off of turbines and a fluid lock that it produces. The converter and what this page starts going over, and we're just going to go down one, two, three, four, so I don't mix you up and get too jumpy here. I have a habit to do that. Um, after we've bypassed the cooler lines, or I mean, bypassed the radiator and installed a standalone cooler, you are going to flush your cooler lines and you're also going to flush your cooler if you've reused it. Um, when you have a transmission, any transmission, it produces debris. It's not a sealed unit. The, unlike an engine where it still does produce debris, just not near as much because you're working with metal and bushings, not transmission, you're working with paper and metal and bushings. And the paper is where you're getting your debris from. Why bypassing the radiator with a standalone cooler is important. Those plastic radiators where the cooler section is are known to crack. If they do crack and you get antifreeze in transmission oil, you will have a gigantic strawberry milkshake. And why that's important is not only for lubrication purposes, the frictions themselves are made from water soluble glue. So as soon as antifreeze hits it or water, if you live in Florida or something, it's just going to tear the paper right off of it. It will dissolve and peel and just kind of fall into the pan and clog the filter up. That's why that's important. Uh, flushing the lines, same deal. When that debris over time, it doesn't matter if you've driven this thing 250,000 miles to 50,000 miles. Debris is going to wear off those clutches and collect. And it's going to collect in a fluid flow pattern throughout all those channels and veins in this unit to your lines, to that big tube. When it goes through that tube or any other part, especially the tube uh, in the radio, that is where all the fluid is going to pass through and all that debris is going to pass through as well. It is going to hit a wall and then finish flowing. You know, nothing is ever really that smooth where it's just a nice snaky pattern. Nothing can really build up. You have corners and cracks and crevices in your whole system. That debris is going to slowly build up in that corner over time. And once you install a new transmission, a new converter, fresh fluid, as soon as that fluid gets hot, it is hard, harder core than, than any degreaser or anything you've ever come across. Hot transmission fluid is the best cleaner in the whole automotive industry. It will wash grease off your hands and it will knock loose that debris too. When it does, it will plow that debris through the system and stop the filter up and you'll burn up. Um, get a can of cooler line flush at AutoZone or blow some serious air through it or both. Um, do something or replace the lines and cooler in general. That's the easiest, simplest way especially since we give you a free one and a bunch of lines like 20 bucks. Moving on to the torque converter installation. After we verify the lines are flushed, clean, coolers installed, we're starting to ready to move along the process here. So before we install the torque converter and the transmission, we want to check the flex plate. Why the flex plate is so important and so 
kind of not really understood that well is a flex plate flexes. It's right in the name. Flex plate is attached to your converter and the engine crank. The flex plate, a wide open throttle, will push the converter towards the transmission. And on D cell, it will spring back towards the engine. That's how it works. That, or why that's important is the torque converter neck plugs into this piece here inside the pump. This is connected to nothing in the pump. It is a rotor. It makes pressure. Converters do not make pressure. Um, pressure comes from the pump. This splines into it. And it should see no load or anything. It just spins in there, pumping fluid, making pressure. Why this is important is if the flex plate flexes too much or the spacing is off, which we'll get into in a minute, and even if the spacing is exactly right, it doesn't matter because your flex plate's over flexing. If your flex plate's old and over flexes, it is going to grind that rotor into the back of the aluminum casting on the pump back and it will slowly tear that up and you'll just get sh aluminum shrapnel throughout the unit. The magnets won't pick it up. It will get everywhere and embed itself. It is a disaster to clean up. If the flex plate also over flexes on the flip side, if it's that bad, the converter, when it springs back, can actually be pulled out of the pump rotor. And when it tries to go back in, since everything's spinning very fast, it will try to not go in the tabs and completely smash itself and completely ruin this. If it gets it's that simple. Um, that's why having a new flex plate is extremely important. And OEM ones, not that much. They're suitable for most applications. Uh, you could always nip it in the butt and get an SFI one. They usually don't look bad. They last a long time. So verify the flex plate. Next would be to uh, pretty much check out the converter, give it a look over, make sure there's no burrs on the neck or anything, and then fill it up with one quart of fluid. It may take you a while. There are some small holes in there that it all bleeds through. But spend some time and dump a quart of fluid. Now, at that point, we're going to install the converter, and I'm going right down the list. We're going to install the converter. And when we install the converter, I have a general guideline right here of you listen for three clicks. Now, that's not a rule. It's a general guideline. You need to take that with a grain of salt. Three clicks may not necessarily seat you, okay? So what you do when you put this in Please, please, please. These are brand new necks, brand new converters, brand new deal. Everything is going to be tight. New bushings, new everything. It's all going to be tight. And this is going to be dry. So please, before you put the converter in, rub a little tranny oil around the neck and the front pump seal. Um, if you slam this thing in dry like people have in the past, it's going to damage the seal and you're going to get it installed and it's going to leak fluid and we don't want that. That's a pain in the ass and it could have all been avoided with a little lube. Lube is your friend. When you go to put this thing in and the seal, o-ring and neck are a little lubed up to ease it in and it will be very hard to get in because it's tight. Everything is new. You're going to shake, twist and rock till everything kind of sets. And what's happening here is you have your input shaft, you lock up O-ring area, and this is an LT model. LS is the same deal, though. And your stator splines. And all this... Not only that, the final click will be this rotor seating. Okay? So you have several things to overcome there, and you just got to work it out. Um, a tip from me to you is the easiest way I've always found to do it since when you have the transmission sitting like this, you're shaking it in, 
grab with your palm the top of the converter towards the belt. You can even put your fingers on the belt and just twist and rock it in. What's happening and why this makes it a little easier is the converter is heavy. It's got some weight. It's going to sag a little bit since it's not in. If you start pushing up at the top and wiggling it in, it will sort of more center that and make it much easier to work itself on the splines and the teeth of that rotor. Little tip from me to you, it'll be a lot faster. Once you hear the three clicks, or at least if you think you heard three clicks, please don't just go by that and start installing stuff. We have a nice little list here. Get a tape measure or a mic. And these specs right here are for every transmission that we do. Here's the 700 R44L60E, 70, 65E, 204R. Um, 1.125. The converter pad to the bell that's the distance there should be sitting inside of it so from the converter pad to the end of the bell should be 1.125 it's very easy to measure that's how you know you're in um, I wanted to touch on something real quick while I say that because we only have 4L60E here okay everybody thinks the 65 and the 70 are all these different mythical unicorn transmissions they're not it's the same parts, the same thing. Uh, the 65 sometimes had five pinions. Not all of them did. If you think you got a 65, you're probably wrong. They didn't come in very many vehicles. The 70 didn't always come with five pinions, and it didn't always come with uh, shot peen shafts. The only thing that makes a 4L70 a 70 is one extra piece of electronic, which I believe I have. Um, this is a plug, but it's similar to this. Um, it's a plug and a wire and a magnet. It plugs into the back of the pump. It is an input speed sensor. It is only a diagnostic tool to read input speed. It is useless, in my opinion. Um, that's the only thing that makes a 70 a 70. And if you think you need a 70, you really don't. And you're going to end up paying a $500 core charge because they've only been around for two years, 07 and 08. You will save so much aggravation if you're setting up your project to just have a 60 with 13 pin connectors and it will be better than you ever dreamed. Because when you're dealing with an aftermarket company like us, none of us are following GM specs. GM's going to make it work. So when we have a level 2 4L65, it doesn't get 5 pinions. It gets 4 pinions because it's a level 2. That's how we build it for 700 horse. If you need five pinions and you have 800 horse, that's where the level three comes in. A 65, 70, all that. A 70 will actually have the input speed sensor. But if you order a level 270, it's not going to have five pinions in it. GMs put those hard parts in to compensate for shitty hydraulics. We do good hydraulics, so you don't need those big beefy parts. They are available as an add-on. But we just ask you to take into account what your vehicle is doing, how much power it has, how much torque, and everything that you're doing with it, and make your own judgment. Okay, I have 700 wheel horsepower. I'm right on the line of the level two. I should probably step up to the level three, give myself some security. That's what we expect of you. And we base all those on weight, 4,000 pounds. If you weigh more than that, your 700 kind of turns into six or 650. That's how it works. I will do a whole nother video explaining that stuff. Going down, we verified our converter is in the bell all the way because of the depth spec we have here. Okay? And that's only for your reference. Moving on, at this point, we would install the transmission. Um, you will, God, heaven forbid, never, ever, do not pull the transmission in with the bell housing bolts ever you will break the pump guaranteed or crack the bell and that is just gonna upset you that is wrong if you're installing this transmission you must keep it level and you push it up flush to the block on the pins before you start tightening bolts that's how it's done that's how it's always been done and that's how you have to do it uh, if you can't handle it by yourself which it isn't too hard if you have a nice jack, uh, get a friend to help you. Once we 
have the tranny bolted up to the block. Everything's kind of installed, which is the next few pages. I'm going to jump around a second, so bear with me. One second here. All right. So real quick, before I go back into torque converter spacing, while you're installing this tranny prior to torque converter spacing, we have here several pages that we've taken the time to write for you about how to install and remove one of these transmissions. And then we even have the four wheel drive section here for a transfer case removal. This is good. If you are new, we got your back right there. Complete instructions, simplified and easy. Now, going back to this and converter spacing. So we've installed the tranny. Those are the next couple pages. Go into converter spacing. This will be the last thing you do. Um, cooler lines are hooked up. Everything's clean, nice, appropriate. Uh, there's a quarter fluid in here already. Transmission's bolted up appropriately. We're going to do converter spacing. And why this ties into the rotor. Now, everybody says these rotors are garbage and this and that and, 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 and you know. No, they're not. They're actually your best friend. These things are so forgiving and so good. They can pump so much volume. Um, it's a vein pump. These came in the 200 4R, the 700 R4, the 4 l 60, 65, and 70, and they interchanged throughout all those units. When we used to build 200 4Rs, they would get a 13 vein rotor instead of a seven vein. Um, there's a big math problem to that. People are gonna tell you 10 veins are better. No, they're not. Um, when you add an area of veins rather than area of meat, you actually get more volume. And, and that's a literal, numbers don't lie. So that's why I'm telling you that. That being said, we don't want that crappy flex plate breaking the rotor when you got your spacing right. At the same time, when you have a new and everything's good in that aspect, we need to measure converter spacing. And what that, and that's so this doesn't break. Because it can do the same thing. Flex plates still flex a little bit. If the spacing's too much, it will still come out. If the spacing's too little, it will grind into it. So how you check your spacing, and I will do a actual video on this when I go put this back in my truck. You have your engine block here with your converter, I'm sorry, engine block and flex plate, and then you have your transmission and converter, okay? With the converter pushed all the way back into the transmission as it shouldn't have moved to start with, you're gonna have this space in between the two, the pad of the flex plate to the pad of the converter. Now, what we need to do here is that space needs to be reduced to one eighth or three sixteenths, and it says so right in this packet on the second paragraph from the bottom. Um, one eighth to three sixteenths of space, okay? So what you're gonna do is, it really ought to be about a quarter inch when you start, which is around about 187 or so, uh, 0.187, something like that, I think is the real measurement, but it'll be roughly a quarter inch, uh, probably a little bit less. When you go to do your spacing, you're, the easiest way I can tell anybody to do it, and this is how I do it, I can see these yahoos trying to fit a micrometer up in this tiny hole of the bell. Please stop. You can't accurately measure things that way. Take a 1 8 inch drill bit, because that's what I prefer, 1 8 inch of spacing, not quite 3 16 um, 1 8 or a 3 16 drill bit, or a 1 8 or 3 16 Allen key, and there's a little hole in the bell housing, or if you have no dust cover like I used to have, it was way easier. Slide the drill bit up between those pads of the converter and flex plate. And then you use about a 60 thousandths washer to get where you need to be. When you have however many washers you have to use, please don't use more than two. You shouldn't have to. If you have to use more than two, you probably are missing the uh, crank spacer that comes with some converters. Most people don't need to use that. But a lot of aftermarket companies base backings when they put them together on 
manufacturer. Um, if you have more than two washers worth, you probably need a spacer. So torque converter, flex plate, space, drill bit, that's one eighth or three sixteenths. You should only need one washer. It ought to bring you right there. That space should be no more than that drill bit with added washers or sometimes none at all. Never use more than two and most people should use at least one. That use typically tends to be the general consensus. Why that's important is because even if you have a new flex plate, it still flexes and it shouldn't flex any more than that spec, one eighth to three sixteenths. The rotor doesn't actually sit all the way down like this, okay? It kind of sits right about in the middle of it is where you want it to be. That lets the converter slide in and out as it should and still turn the rotor to make pressure. And the same scenario can happen that I explained prior in the video if you get it wrong. Um, we know if you get it wrong and how we can tell is this is a used rotor for demonstration purposes. That shiny spot is how far your converter neck has set in and worn it down. And this happens almost instantaneously. It doesn't take very long to wear this black coating off. Um, it doesn't even take a mile to do it. So this right here, black that's left, is the space that you should have, which is about 3 16 on this rotor. That's what we're looking for. The converter doesn't actually set in here all the way. There's that black is that much space that you need to have for it to operate properly. And I hope that makes sense. And we'll be doing a much, 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 much more in-depth video on that as I get time and I actually put this thing back in my truck. So we have that. Next, and this is one of the last things, videos coming to a close. This part is also extremely important. Okay, we're done with the converter. We've bolted that up once we have that space. We're almost ready to rock. At this point, all the dipsticks are wrong, especially low car. Oh my goodness, they're bad. Uh, even GMs are wrong. And what you really need to do, fluid level and filter and cooling are extremely important in any automatic. So at this point, when everything's bolted up, your torque converter's bolted up, I needed you guys to drop the pan. You know, you shouldn't have put any fluid in the transmission yet anyway. You need to drop the pan. I don't care if you don't want to or not. I'm going to save you a lot of grief. Don't be lazy about it. Drop the pan. I know it's a brand new tranny, but here's why. Your dipstick is going to be wrong. I almost guarantee it, and I put money on it. Um, typically, the hash mark is all the way down here, okay, about halfway through the pan. Well, if you really think about it, you can add like almost three more quarts, sometimes four. Um, where you should have your dipstick mark is right at the gasket area of the pan, right here, flush with the gasket. If you do that, you will have fit more fluid, you will have submerged the entire filter, and you will have a very healthy pickup. Uh, and, and, all, and cooling on that transmission. Um, that's not even overfilling it. Please don't follow GM spec uh, because it's wrong. You're not doing a stock vehicle anymore. You're doing a race car or a street car. When somebody calls me and says, well, GM says nine quarts of fluid. Okay, they may be right. That's GM's. You're different. You've come from a 12-inch converter. Actually, I think that's an 11-inch. You've come from a 12 inch converter all the way down to a nine and a half billet. You've reduced the amount of fluid that can even go in there. You've increased the cooler size from that little tube. So you've increased the amount of fluid there. You've put a deeper pan on it. You've increased the amount of fluid there. You've lengthened your lines and done all kinds. Do you see where the variable changes? GM has a certain layout. These lines are this long, it's this cooler, it's this 12 inch converter, and this takes nine quarts where we have the dipstick set. Stop listening to your ASC GM master tech. They're technically wrong, okay? 
when you change converter size, cooler size, line size, pan size, you ain't doing nine quarts anymore. You're probably up somewhere around 11 to 13. And we even tell you in here, expect anywhere from nine to 14 quarts, okay? There is no set number, and this is gonna come from our fill process. So before we even get going on filling the transmission, mark your dipstick at the pan rail. And I don't have a dip boot, and this is an old shitty dipstick, but as you can see, right here is where the hot is, okay? I know you can't see that very well, and I'll do a video on this, but uh, hot is right here, okay? It is probably about a half an inch lower than the actual gasket area. Take a pocket knife or a Dremel or something and make your own hot full hash mark right at the pan gasket. Because they're cold is actually almost expand that much in a transmission. It might expand an eighth of an inch. It does not expand uh, two and a half inches. So I hope that makes sense. Your dipstick's wrong. Please check it. Put the pan back on and you're good to go. No need to mess with the filter. You've made your own mark. And from now on, you know it's going to be right. If you overfill past that, you have a good inch or two or three to go um, till the danger zone of fluid being blended up in the, in the components and making aeration. So just call it there. Call it good. Do not use silicone. I know people are going to argue with me about that. When you go to put this pan back on, they're like, oh, I can't get it to stop leaking or... I've always used silicone. No. On an engine, you use silicone. Okay, you have to. On a transmission, if you use silicone, you will screw this thing up so bad, it's unreal. And I may not even ever know what's wrong with it other than it's just full of silicone. When you paste on a whole tube of Permatex, or even a little, it'll squish it down into the inside of the pan. And then right here, on the gasket rail, right under the servo, is the release hole for the servo. Everybody that uses silicone covers that thing up and it won't, it'll act a lot really funny, like it'll be kind of laggy and it won't actually shift out a second and forth. That's because you covered up that hole. And within a short amount of time, you're gonna burn it up. Use a gasket, use the torque spec on the pan. Um, I believe it's like eight, foot pounds or something like that. It's not very much. Uh, at the very least, you could go 80 inch pounds. Um, that's kind of what I've done in the past. I don't know GM's actual spec, but for me, 80 inch pounds has worked. Um, don't go impacting your gasket on though, please. Uh, put the three quarter inch gun down and just use a hand ratchet. Get them snug. This shouldn't be tight because if it's too tight, you will split the gasket. Um, so please keep that in mind. So that fluid level must be full at all times. We're going on the fill procedure now. And I told you everything changed. So start off with a good case of fluid. And again, I don't think I went over this, but I use the cheap stuff. This is a Starfire Dex3 ATF synthetic blend. It's relatively expensive. It's a good... Um, it's a good fluid. I've used it my whole time I've been doing this. I've never had a transmission. I've never even had the fluid turn past pink, okay? And it's really come from I've serviced them with the correct filter, the correct amount of fluid, and I've kept them cool. I'm not going to argue with people to where they might be a diehard Amsoil or Royal Purple guy. I'm sure there's a science to that. I do not believe you, but to me, it's kind of a waste of money. Engines, I feel like that stuff matters because you're dealing with just pure metal uh, all the time, high RPMs and shit like that. Transmissions have paper and other odds and ends in it. And the transmission, in my opinion, and I've never seen otherwise, 
I've seen no benefit to using expensive fluid and I've seen no disadvantage using cheap fluid. It, I don't think it really cares, but what it does care about is the filter. And we're going to get to that in a minute. So you're going to start off with whatever, a, some kind of Dex3 or better, good quality, at least Dex3. I don't think they sell anything but Dex6 anymore, so that's fine too. You're going to start off. Now, what you're going to do, take into account you've already put a quart in that converter. Okay, and we're expecting anywhere from 9 to 14 quarts, depending on your setup. So that being said, we're going to dump roughly five or six quarts down the dipstick before startup even. That fills the pan up roughly. And we use an OEM deep pan. It's more than sufficient. Um, you don't need a super deep pan. It's actually kind of stupid in my opinion. Uh, having those deep pans are not better. They're just a kind of a showy, nice pan for a waste of money. The deep OEM pan is good enough for every application. Don't care what you're doing. Uh, that being said, five to six quarts ought to fill that up. Start the vehicle. Okay, we go through this whole fill procedure. Go through this whole fill procedure right here. On the next step is the start of this page. After you've added five quarts down the dipstick, started the vehicle after that, you're going to add two more quarts right away. Okay? That is going to give you a total of eight because you have one in the converter, you've started with five or six, and you've added two. I'm saying five or six just because it is what it is. Now, at this point, you and a buddy or yourself, someone is going to shift through all the gears while you're filling. All gears, manual one, two, three, D, one, two, three, four, neutral, park, hit lockup in D4, and reverse. Have the car on jacks while you're doing this. Okay. Reverse and lock up. Everybody forgets. I don't even know why they don't count them as gears, but reverse and lock up are your most important. Lock up's going to finish filling all the crucial components in valve train, in the pump, and in the body, and in the converter itself. Reverse is a massive circuit. You have the reverse input drum. locked inside. You have the band locked around that. And you have the low piston and low reverse clutches locked too. And the, uh, the servo board to apply the band. That is a huge amount of fluid. So when you think you've got your pan full, think again. Because once you hit reverse, that whole pan is going to get sucked dry. And it's all going to go to those components where it's kind of going to stay. Because hydraulics don't just drain back and, and go back, you know, they the fluid kind of stays there and then more fluid pours in and it creates the pressure that it needs and the volume and everything else to apply those components rock solid. Once you've gone through the gears, including reverse and lockup with the car on jack several times, just back and forth, back and forth. You're not going to hurt anything. Keep filling till you're at your full mark that you made. Once that's been done, cap everything up, take her around the block. Um, do that a couple times. Bring the car or truck back and let it sit overnight. What this is going to do is let air burp out of the system through the vent tube from the initial fill. Uh, air is no good for hydraulics. You don't want spongy hydraulics. After that, I don't know about other companies, but I'm here to crack a myth here. We don't have a break in really. Uh, we ask you to change the fluid and filter after a thousand miles to get rid of the break in debris, which is mostly just clutch fuzz. Um, it's very fine. You won't be able to see it, but it will still stop your filter up. After a thousand miles, you'll change the fluid with the appropriate filter. After that, I just tell people once a year. That way you don't forget. It's always healthy. It ain't going to cost you that much. Uh, and everybody's happy. The transmission will last a really long time. Um, so yeah, let the air burp, you know, make sure it's full, service it, 
And then what I was getting at was there is no bacon. After you've let this thing sit, you're ready to go. Air's burped out. She's full. There's no such thing as too cold. You have an automatic. So when these other companies tell you, you need to drive this thing really nice and easy till 90 days, basically when your warranty's up for most people. And then it fails, and then your warranty's up. But they got your money. So what I'm telling you is, at Performa Build anyway, we don't have a damn break-in. It's complete BS. It's an automatic. It's going to You can't make the clutches apply really any softer with your foot than you would any other time. So after you filled this thing up, before your thousand mile braking even, go do your first burnout. Light up a smoke show, race, have fun. That's why you called us. Um, nothing's gonna happen to it. It is a complete myth. There is no braking on an automatic. Engines, yes, it's a little different. Not with this, okay? And I'm saying that to you personally on camera you have it there is no break into our transmission just the initial thousand mile fluid change and that's just to get that clutch fuzz out of there and you have a nice healthy hydraulic system and after we skip over this a little bit these are those uh, install instructions for for newbies or anybody that has a question and don't be ever ashamed of that you know i'm um I'm the first person I'll tell you I still make mistakes all the time. I forgot to hook up the cooler the first two times I did this. Whether it be I was in a rush, I do this all day long, and I'm mad fried when I'm doing my own or had too much beer. I don't know. It happens. Uh, I have three we're done. But one of the last things I want to go over is deep pans and filters. Uh, in this packet, it will tell you if you are changing your pan to a deep one, which is completely unnecessary, please call us first, okay? And I will be doing a video on this too. There are those five inch deep pans, you know, you're super cool, yeah. If you do that, fine, more power to you. But if you do, there's certain filters that you opt for. We use an OEM deep pan, deep filter, okay? That's every single unit, including our 700 R4s that we actually put a 4L60E pump in. We get rid of the pipe and, and a lot of other things that go with the 700 that were problem. This is your deep filter with your OEM deep pan. This is what you put back in your performability unit every single time. This is a shallow filter. It is metal, it is very thin. AutoZone is going to give you one of these when you say, I need a filter for a 4L60. Take it back right away. If it doesn't look like this thick black plastic filter, do not use it. If it doesn't look like what came out of it, why the hell would you put something in like that, okay? I don't, unfortunately, have a part number to cross-reference that. The easiest thing I can tell you is any 2006 GTO with a 4L60 in it will have that black deep filter. It's the easiest one to do. The shallow filter came in a lot of F-bodies and pre-1997 uh, vehicles, and it was used with a shallow pan that nobody really uses anymore. It creates a uh, whirlpool effect sitting that close to the bottom the way it's designed. And it's a very piss poor design. GM changed it relatively quickly. Do not put this in a deep pan of any kind. Garbage. This is what you use for 99% of everything. If you're using a super deep pan or a Corvette, you're going to use a C5 Corvette filter. Why this is different is it has a little sump tube okay so if you're using a super deep pan and it doesn't come with a little filter extension you're going to cut two slits in this and use this there's only a couple different kinds of filters for the 60. do not use a shallow under any circumstances if you do the whole point of a filter is 
to sit at the very bottom of the pan, okay? If you have a filter way up here by the gasket, which that's exactly what this will look like, it's, on, it's, it's right at the valve body, okay? Your pan is gonna be clear down here at the bottom. Number one, the filter relies on the pan to support it and keep it in the pump. It's gonna wiggle and slop the more potholes you hit and eventually fall out and you're gonna stop moving. The other bad benefit, or not benefit, the other bad thing about using a shallow filter in a deep pan, there's no point because it's sucking fluid off the top. You wanna to suck fluid from the bottom. So there's all this, you spent money on this big deep pan and there's all this nice fluid at the bottom and it's just there. It's not really doing anything. You're going around curves and stuff, that fluid sloshes and it takes fluid away from the filter. You suck a little bit of air, you might even not notice, and you get a burn right there. Keep your filters at the bottom of your pan. They need it for support and they need it for fluid flow. It's pretty simple. Um, lastly, wrapping it up here, do not on tape on your cooler line fittings. 99% of the time it will crack the case. They will seal. There is no reason to keep using silicone and, and Teflon tape on, on transmissions. It, it's not necessary. I don't know why everybody's so afraid. Moving on. You know, and that's, that's pretty cut and dry. Going back to uh, servicing. This goes over our thousand mile wear and change that, you know, I just talked about and fluid and filter. Okay. Another thing that touches on this is GM put drain plugs in early on in the years. They quit doing that. And I will tell you why they realized it was an extremely idea to put drain plugs in. If you've gotten our unit, you might notice it has a GM drain plug in it, but it won't come out. I'm not going to take them out because they can't be taken out. GM, people were getting these, GM tried to be nice, and they weren't changing the filter. They were just draining the fluid and leaving the filter in there and filling it up, being lazy. GM eventually just got rid of the damn things. But until they could, they put an ultra super Loctite to which I have never seen, okay? I don't care if you have a one inch impact, it will destroy the pan before it takes that out. The only way to get them out is if you have to heat this thing so hot, there's a potential to melt it and it will actually blow up kind of in your face like a little mini nuclear bomb. Then it will come out, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, I just want you to crack the back of the pan, put a catch under it, and just wait for it to drain a little bit. If you want a drain plug, that's on you, okay? I want you to change the filter, and I'm going to make sure you do. If you don't, you will have a failed unit very fast, within a year, and it's because you didn't service it. So to touch on that, GM did that for a reason. You'll notice in the 70s and the later models, there's a little indent there, but no bolt. They got rid of it exactly for that. And uh, if I can find my mouse. Warranty info. This is it. If you have any questions, there's our number. Uh, Dex3 or better. We do sell FTI converters. Um, we have for a long time. I'm also selling Boss Hog converters. I like him a lot. And Nelson's a great guy. Um, really knows his stuff. And I'm personally Grand National very shortly. Um, I'm a huge fan. He's very knowledgeable. But for the FTI guys, if you choose to buy their converter through us, they actually have put time and effort into researching a fluid. Um, it sort of makes me itch. But it works good with their converters. So if you wanted to use that, fine. Otherwise, if you can't afford it or you don't want to, do what I do, Dex3 or better. And the last two pages here are going to be overall the entire warranty, which, 
you know, to comfort you guys a little bit, when you hear warranty, everybody kind of gets weird and, and freaks out a little bit. If you've ever dealt with us or talked to us, and I've explained that we're all doing the same thing, we're nice as shit. Um, we aren't going to wave a contract in your face. You know, if it's your fault, it's your fault. We're going to call it. Um, if you're honest, have good communication about it, make you fucked up, we might do you a solid. Um, 99% of the time, we just want to take care of everybody. We get mistakes happen. All we're asking for is communication. The only things we just about don't cover in that list are breaking the pump on install, getting antifreeze in your system, or using the wrong filter or not filling it up. Any of which we can easily tell as soon as we get the unit back, just like the converter spacing, which we also don't cover. If you mess this up, it's on you, not me. Um, I might do you a favor, but it's going to be based on situations. So that's kind of it, guys. I wanted to really go over that with you. Please, it's very great. Um, we've done a lot of little stuff in this video, and this is going to be your best friend. If you don't have a copy, and you need to print it on the website. If you have any questions, give me or Alan at that number provided. And if anything, just visit www.performbuilding.com. Uh, this brand new great year for us, and we are going to be crushing it like we have been for the past however long. Um, I look forward to this YouTube year, and please click that subscribe button. And stay tuned for a lot more in-depth videos on the basics here that will make you a much better mechanic, automotive enthusiast, whatever you want to call yourself. I love you. Appreciate it, guys. You're awesome. Thank you for all your support.